We're on live. Welcome YouTube live audience. Welcome everyone on Facebook and to those of you who are able to join us here this evening. Um, brave the elements to be out here. It's a privilege to be back again with uh, Brother Fiedler and Lindsay's joining me up here as well. And we're going to have a word of prayer and then we're going to start with just some discussion on the questions that came in from earlier. Really good questions that were sent in. Um, from earlier. And I'm going to ask Chad at some point if you want to put Pastor Jericho's number up. You don't need to do it now, but we'll do it after our question session uh, so that everyone can see um, the number to text in more questions that they may have because if you have questions, we want to answer them. And, and it's kind of nice to have this informal discussion time. But before we begin, Lindsay, why don't you have an opening word of prayer for us? Sure. <clears throat> Father, we just thank you for the spiritual food that you have been giving us. We thank you for the insights. Um, that you have not left us defenseless against the attacks of Satan, but that you have Amen. a strategic um, answer to the challenges and the problems that we face in this world. And mm. I just pray that you would come into our hearts now, that you would send the Holy Spirit uh, to give us wisdom and insight and understanding in your ways. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so we had a number of questions that came in, and I'm just going to start here right at the top. First question is, in all of Lucifer's great wisdom, will he soon realize the folly of his ways? This great controversy lesson should become easy for us to understand. Should it not be easy for him to see the dead end of his actions? Is it possible he will ask forgiveness in the end and ask God to forgive him? Wouldn't it be nice in a certain way? I mean, you know... <laughs> I, I, I have no expectation of that. Uh, certainly there's nothing in the uh, prophetic, you know, inspired word that, that leads us to believe that Lucifer is ever going to, to change his mind. Hmm. But who, shouldn't he understand? You know, should he not understand? And really the only, the only explanation I can suggest is that evil distorts and clouds perception. That's true. And I don't think he's mentally capable of understanding. Hmm. Um, it doesn't mean he's stupid. He's not. Mm -hmm. But you know, there there is a, a huge role, and that'll be actually developed in a, in the presentation tonight. But perception is a huge element in the the Lord's plan for salvation. Right, right. And just like Israel, you know, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. If you could see. Mm -hmm you know, the time of your visitation. But now you, are, you can't, you're blind. You know? right. and, and it's that blindness that is the, closes the door, I, I would say. Wow, wow, that's very interesting. I'd love to chase that more, but we have a few more questions to get to. So Lindsay, what's the next one? So this is from a parent. Um, please use an object lesson for children <clears throat> to define rebellion in the context of today's sermon. Yeah, I, 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 I've, I've seen these, I've heard the questions before, so it's not the first time I've heard this. I, I'm, there's a lot of ways we could go with that. Yes, there uh, are. And my memory of Uncle Arthur is like every other story is rebellion. <laughs> you know? yes. The bedtime stories, yes. Yeah, Uncle Arthur's bedtime stories, right. Um, I can't say that I have one that encompasses many of the features of, of Lucifer's rebellion, which is good because we don't want our kids to encompass all those features all at once. Right, <laughs> right, right. Deal with them one at a time if you can, folks. But um, <clears throat> I suppose, you know, any sort of a story, uh, if I were trying to break it down for a, a child and, and tell it in that way, you know, I'd, a story where maybe some evil influence from the neighborhood is, is taking the, uh, the child in question, you know, and, and, oh, you don't have to do what your mom says. I mean, come on, she's old and stupid. You know, come and do this or something. I don't know if that's a very good answer, but that's that's kind of the direction I think maybe they're they're wanting me to go. Or well, I think that I think that is actually I, I like that because what it's showing is that how our evil influences, and then in that story, and Uncle Arthur has several of these stories. So if you're familiar with the bedtime stories, um, you can look in the back for stories that line up with different character qualities. It's really good, mm -hmm. or different challenges you might be facing as a parent, and. 
So what, but if you can have, there's several stories in there where an evil influence is brought in, hey, don't follow along with your parents, and then out of that influence, really bad things Comes happen. trouble. A lot of trouble. <laughs> Amazing, how would we know? It's, it's unreal, I think. If, <laughs> yeah, so, so I think there's, there's some, some wisdom in that, and, and stories are a powerful way. That's why the Bible yeah. has so many stories to bring lessons right, across. Right. <clears throat> okay, we must move on. Good, good question. Um, what are the most significant things that make humans different from angels? Um, I'm going to say that the best thing that I would know or even guess, uh, because I, I, I'll be honest, I, I don't know that I can totally, completely, 100% explicitly document this, okay? But it appears to me, as, as we dealt with in the, the presentation this morning, uh, well, I know this, that, that Ellen White says that human beings have the capacity for continual advancement. And she says there's no other creature does. That's very interesting. So we can, there is no limit to where we can reach in our advancement. That's, that, that's what she says. Yeah, in a converted state. In a variety state. of slightly mm -hmm. different ways. It's, it's, oh, the statements are all quite right. similar. But, but, you know, and I, I surmise, hmm. this is what I don't have explicit evidence for, I surmise that, that angels were basically created where they're created and, and, and I don't see them endowed with a capacity for growth the same. Hmm. So it's so kind of like their like you station. said earlier, they might have like a glass ceiling. Yeah. They can't really, may not yeah. be able to pass. And that's, that, to me, that's the only way I can really say that, you know, angels or, or human beings were created a little lower than the angels, then there would be a time when they would be equal to the angels, and then there would be a time when they would be above the angels. It seems wow. to me that one's sitting still and the other's moving. Which, which really brings out the humility of the angels that have stayed loyal to God. Yes. And, and that's incredibly, uh, that's amazing. Right in front of, what is it, Desire of Ages, I think it is, in about page 13, 14, 17 or something like that. Um, you know, that the, the angels of heaven work tirelessly to bring us to a relationship that they themselves, you know, is closer than they yeah. themselves will ever achieve or attain or something, you know. Amazing. So, yeah, that's, that's, that's what makes the universe work, by the way, is, is self Lessness. Selflessness, yeah. Yeah, wow. Okay, we've got just a couple more minutes. Lindsay, what's the next one? All right, so you stated the core of Lucifer's rebellion is that he lost faith in God's wisdom. My question is, did Lucifer ever have... If, sorry, if Lucifer did not have any regret, could it be because he got too far into his sin? Or... Another way to state it is, did Lucifer ever have any regret after his rebellion? If not, could it be because he had gone too far in his sin? Yeah, mm. I, I, I think there's, there's kind of truth both directions there, and, and we could also, you know, kind of condition our answer a little bit on what we mean by regret. You know, by regret, do we mean true repentance? Mm -hmm. Or this isn't working well. I, <laughs> I really don't like where I'm at yeah, now. I, I want things I like to be different for me. Yeah. yeah. It's so like in, in Story of Redemption, there's that, that classic account where Lucifer, this is... This was before the creation of man, I'm pretty sure. And then Lucifer says, you know, uh, this is not working well. Things are looking grim. He calls an angel and says, hey, I, I would like to talk with Jesus here. We need, to, we need to discuss this. And he says, you know, I'll go back to my position. And then to me, the most, the most poignant element of it is it says that uh, Christ wept at Satan's woe, mm. but must tell him as the voice of God, that he had gone too far, the seeds of rebellion were still within him, and they had not been exterminated, and he was not safe back in heaven. Wow. And that, that's such an, an interesting contrast, because he was many times, Ellen White says, offered his position back simply on, you know, would you agree to go back and do what you're supposed to do and stop ra you know, raising Cain, right? <laughs> okay. Um, and, and I think maybe he thought, well, just, okay, yeah, I'll take the offer now, but now it was too but late. But it's too late. There comes a moment of no return. Yeah. So Scary. just like you see when the antediluvians couldn't go into the ark after the door was shut, and yep. they all of a sudden like, yes, we'll take that up now. Yeah, we'd like to get on, but it's too late. Right. Right. Jacob and Esau. Jacob, Jacob Esau. and Esau. Yeah, yeah exactly. Quite a number of examples of that. There comes a point in everyone's life where the dice cast. Yeah. And the decision's made. Wow. That's sobering. I, I can't imagine how hard that would have been for Christ. Yeah. I mean, they, they, they had lived together for who knows how many right. eons. Right. Jesus, one, Jesus, Jesus loved Lucifer. Yeah, yeah. Still does, Yeah. to be and, honest. And, I, I, in my own little, you know, whatever perception of things, I envision the last thought that Lucifer hears or senses before his final 
terminal existence, you know, existence is totally terminated, the last thing he's going to hear is, I love you, Lucifer. Wow. Heartbreaking. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay, last question for this evening. Um, the question is, how can we verify Lucifer's, de Lucifer's deception of the other angels? Again, there's a little ambiguity in that question, and I, mm -hmm. I'm not sure exactly. To, if, if the question is verify the nature of his deception, mm -hmm. well, then I have to go to Spirit of Prophecy. And there are quite a number of statements. And she generally limits them to she says things like, uh, he implied doubt. Mm -hmm. And uh, so she speaks in general terms. She doesn't, she doesn't give the exact words or anything of that nature that I've ever found yet. Anyhow. Yeah. Um, the other way of looking at the question is maybe the, de the other angels were deceived on their own or something like that. And, and I think, Lindsay, didn't you have Revelation yeah. 12 there? Yeah, yeah, if you can give us that verse there. Um, I, think, I think it implies it very strongly at least. Right, right. Yeah, so it's, it's Revelation 12, 4. It talks about his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven. We know the stars represent angels from earlier in Revelation and threw them to the earth. So his, his tail actually drew the stars of heaven. Yeah. And Ezekiel talks about the, the multitude of his trafficking. He was trading his ideas with the others. Yeah, so. Yeah. Yeah. so I think if we're looking at the question of was Lucifer the instigator, mm -hmm. uh, those are the indicators that I see. That you see in the Bible. That's very good. Yeah. Wish we had more time. Thank you so much. Thank you all for your questions. I'm going to ask uh, Chad to throw that number up for us one more time. I really appreciate he and Josiah are running uh, things back in the sound booth. But these are the kind of questions we want to wrestle with. If you have questions that come up during the presentation this evening or others, we're going to try to take some time to just do a fireside ch chat each evening and just work through the questions and talk about them, discuss them. And um, we want, as a church, and I know I want to grow, I know you do as well, we want to grow deeper in our understanding of these vital issues that are coming here as we approach the end of time and what's taking place. So... Um, with that said, I'm going to transition the time over to okay. Brother Fiedler and let you take it on for this evening. Okay. And I think, Chad, you may need to wake up my computer up there. You did okay? Are we uh, coming up? Uh, technology is so wonderful when it technologizes. Is that just my slow hard drive trying to get started? Yeah. Okay. Well, why don't I just ad lib for a little bit then? Because we're not getting the not getting the the screen. We we are going to move on. <laughs> um, like I said uh, this morning, you know, I almost wish the second one could have been the uh, the, the twelve o'clock um, or the eleven o'clock, I should say. Go ahead, just hit an F five, Chad. Um, because we were talking, we, we spoke this morning about Lucifer, and, and now we get, if you can see the screen, everybody out in the uh, in, in, uh, live feed land, but anyhow, now we, we get to talk about Jesus, <laughs> which would have been really fitting for, uh, for a church service, you know, but that's just the way it goes sometimes. So, so basically what we're doing now is we're, we're just following a, a line of progression. Um, <clears throat> Lucifer pressed accusations in heaven. He, he kind of laid down the gauntlet. And the ball was in heaven's court, as the saying might go, I suppose. Um, remember Lucifer, on, on, the, on the title screen for Lucifer there, the, the little subhead thing was, let me, no, excuse me, for Lucifer it was, um, try something new. There we go. Try something new. And... Notice this one is, let me show you. That's the key, the key thought going through here. I think, Chad, you're probably trying to get that to go completely full screen, and I don't know why it's not, but I suppose we can live with it. So, anyhow. <clears throat> is my clicker working? That'll be important. Uh, it will work better if I turn it on. That's probably a key thing. Here we go. Okay, so this is actually the slide we left off with this morning. These are the accusations that Lucifer pressed against the, uh, the government of heaven. Now, let me just 
be clear that you know, Ellen White covers these topics in a multitude of different wordings. So the wording here is my own, and, and I think it's very possible that somebody else might have taken that same information and distilled it down into 10 categories or eight categories. But, but this, this is pretty much, I don't know, this is the way it made sense to me. Um, <clears throat> and so the point is that these accusations now are, are resting on the, the government of God. You know? So what do we do about them? Um, one of the fascinating things to me is that God said, yeah, I'll deal with that. But let's set the stage first. And that took 4,000 years. <laughs> you know, God, God wasn't apparently going to hurry the process, which is not to say that he was ignoring it or treating it lightly, but there was a stage to be set. And, and Lucifer had to develop his ideas to a a representative stage before a complete response or a, an effective response could be given. And so he was, he was given 4,000 years to do that. And then in the fullness of time, Jesus came, okay? Here's some of the, the issues involved. How shall the universe know that Lucifer is not a safe and just leader? To their eyes, he appears right. Now, isn't that fascinating? This is the unfallen universe. And Lucifer looks right. They didn't go with him, but he looks right. Well, why didn't they go with him if he looks right? And I think there's a simple answer for that. It's a vital and an incredibly important answer. Why didn't the two-thirds of the angels go with him? And I don't believe it's because the smart ones stayed behind and the dumb ones got taken in. I, I just don't believe that. The difference, and I can't tell you why it should be different from angel to angel, but the difference, I believe, is, is nothing more nor less than faith. Some of them just simply said, wow, that sounds convincing. Oh, I'm, I'm with you. And others said, that sounds convincing, but man, I trust God. <laughs> um, faith. Faith is always the safety factor when it comes to any matter, any spiritual matter beyond my intelligence. I, I, I love that. You know, it's like I, I like to be smart. I, you know, well, someday maybe I will be, but I, I, I aspire to be smart. Let's put it that way. You know, I, I love understanding things. But faith is there precisely for that which I don't understand. That's the only time I really need faith. You know, fitness. That's why you would walk by faith, not by sight. If it was sight, then you know, I could just exercise my own good judgment, right? Anyhow, to their eyes he appears right. They cannot see as God sees beneath the outward covering. They cannot know as God knows. Then to work to unmask him and make plain to the angelic host that his judgment is not God's judgment, that he has made a standard of his own and exposed himself to the righteous indignation of God would create a state of things which must be avoided. I think the simple explanation for that is it would cost souls. If God had handled this prematurely, it would cost souls. And God says, no, 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 no. We are doing nothing that will cost any unneeded souls. <clears throat> God desired that a change take place and that the work of Satan be brought out in its genuine aspect. Now notice what, what's going on here. God desired a change take place and the work of Satan be brought out in its genuine aspect. God says, I want people to see this. There is a huge role in here of the act of revelation, not the, not the quality of, of revelation as in divine inspiration type of revelation, but the, the act of revelation, clarifying, okay, and perception. It's, it's our salvation to see clearly. It's, it's our salvation for the issue to be portrayed clearly. So that's what God wanted to do. He wanted a change to take place. The work of Satan be brought out in its genuine aspect. But the exalted angel standing next to Christ was opposed to the Son of God. 
The underworking was so subtle that it could not be made to appear before the heavenly host as the thing it really was. And, and we're back again now to something that God could not do. Remember, I mentioned that this morning. There are things that God cannot do. And at this time, with those and angelic individuals and in that circumstance, in that situation, it could not be made to appear. It could not be clarified. And so it wasn't the smart angels that won because none of them could understand it. It was those who trusted who won. Satan could not be presented to the universe at once in his real character. His crooked course must be allowed to continue until he should reveal himself as an accuser, a deceiver, a liar, and a murderer. So, so notice this. I mean, God is, in one sense, I think it's, it's fair to say, God is not in any way fighting Lucifer. He's fighting to define, to display, to clarify truth, and allowing Lucifer to expose himself. Lucifer's destruction is self-inflicted damage. Satan had disguised himself in a cloak of falsehood, and for a time it was impossible to tear off the covering so that the hideous deformity of his character could be seen. He must be left to reveal himself in his cruel, artful, wicked works. God's purpose is to place things upon an eternal basis of security. Time must be given for Satan to develop the principles which were the foundation of his government. The heaven and the universe must see worked out the principles which Satan declared were superior to God's principles. God's order must be contrasted with Satan's order. The corrupting principles of Satan's rule must be revealed. The principles of righteousness expressed in God's law must be demonstrated as unchangeable, perfect, eternal. Now, I want you to notice some particular words here on this screen, you know. Not only are there things that God can't do, <laughs> there are things that he, he has to do, okay? At least to get to the end result. It's, it's not like God says, oh, we could get there this way, we could get there that way. You know, it's amazing. I mean, there's that famous statement, you know, uh, God has a thousand ways to provide our needs of which we know nothing. Well, that's, that's, that's just little old me. You'd think that for saving the whole universe, he'd probably have a million different ways. No, one, just one. One, exactly and only one way to save the universe. Kind of a fascinating thing. So there are these things that, that God must do. And I want you to notice the nature of what it is he must do. He must give time for Satan to develop his principles so they could be seen. The universe must see, right? God's order must be contrasted. Both sides have to be seen in order to have a contrast. Satan's rule must be revealed. God's law must be demonstrated. This is this whole revelation, perception type of thing that's going on. And it is the, it, it's the centerpiece of the divine strategy, right? It's, uh, it's, it's, the, it's the battle plan. The unfallen worlds saw that the character of God could be vindicated only through this trial and conflict of the two forces. So they couldn't, they, they couldn't see the outcome, but they knew full well that we got two things going on here, and, and, and they're going to have to hit head on head. The attributes of God must be made to appear. Of the stability of his government, there must be no question. Now here's the problem. Jesus comes to do that, right? But look at this. No verbal description could reveal God to the world. Through a life of purity, a life of perfect trust and submission to the will of God, a life of humiliation, such as even the highest seraph in heaven would have shrunk from, God himself must be revealed to humanity. Okay, so in the story of redemption, there is the account of how, you know, uh, the council in heaven met, and they broke up, you know, and they came to announce, and, and, and God says, my son is going to go and live and suffer and, and redeem as many of the sinful human races as possible. And the angels said, no, not him, right? And, and multitudes, or I don't remember how it's worded, but, you know, angels, volunteers, no, no, I'll go, let me go. They didn't know what they were talking about. They would have shrunk from it if they had seen the whole of it. They just had no idea what Jesus was going to do. This is what was necessary for God to be revealed to humanity. <clears throat> because the basic 
underlying lie, right, the lie of Lucifer was God is selfish. Now, how do you prove you're not selfish? You know, if I gave you $100, would that prove that I'm not selfish? If I gave you $1,000, would that prove that I'm not selfish? If I gave you a million dollars, would that prove that I'm not selfish? You know, if I, if I worked for you a month, would that prove I'm not selfish? If I worked for you free of charge for a month, would that prove I'm not selfish? No, because there's always the potential for some ulterior motive thing going on somewhere. What proves unselfishness? Well, at the end of the game, will you give up your life? Greater love hath no man than he lay down his life for his brother. And so Christ came to reveal the Father, and that could only be done through and up to, including the crucifixion. That's just, just the, the reality of what it takes to reveal the character of God. Okay. <clears throat> Isaiah gives us a touch of this. He saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore, his own arm brought salvation for him and his own righteousness had sustained him. Jesus had to do this himself. He was the only one that could reveal the Father because he was the only one who was one with the Father. He was the only one that wouldn't shrink from, <laughs> from the task at hand. How important is this? Well, Look at this statement. This is like majorly important. Without the correct knowledge of God, the human family would be divested of all divine strength. Now, just stop there for a moment and try to, uh, even out there in, in uh, live stream land, condition yourselves or discipline yourselves. Control yourselves. Don't read the rest of the, of the statement right now. Okay, just stop there. Okay, <laughs> I know it's hard to do, but temptation is 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 good to build strength. So <laughs> But the first two lines, without the correct knowledge of God, the human family would be divested of all divine strength. So what does divested mean? Again, this is, this is, you know, this is third grade vocabulary, evidently back when Ellen White you know, went, went through grade three, right? Well, <clears throat> divested, you may have, you, you know, there's a bit of a, of a controversy or something, a movement going on calling for uh, colleges to divest themselves of all investments in anything that happens to be the unfavorable thing of the day, right? You know, a few years ago it was investment in Israel and there's investment in oil companies and there's investment in, you know, whatever. Um, and they're, called, they're being called to divest themselves. It means to, to have it taken away from or to, you know, get it out of, whatever. So the human family would be divested of all divine strength without a correct knowledge of God. This is how important this perception, revelation, issue is. Without the correct knowledge, we lose all divine strength. That's big. <laughs> Let's go on to the statement now. With false attributes kept before the mind as belonging to God, the human family would be the dupes of satanic lies and the subjects of satanic agencies, and he, Satan, could practice upon their credulity with success. What a great statement for vocabulary words. I mean, this is, this is amazing. So let's start with the one on the bottom line there. What's credulity mean, right? Well, okay, so a close synonym today, we'd probably say something more along the lines of gullibility. Okay. He could practice upon their gullibility. Credulity comes from the, the root word of credible, right? Incredible or credulity or type of thing, okay? But there's another word up here. What about that word there, dupes? It's not a real common word these days. What does it mean to be the dupes of satanic lies? Okay, well, <clears throat> uh, dupe is related to the word duplicitous. And duplicitous comes from the word duplicity, okay? And so duplicity is being two-faced, right? When I talk to these people, I say one thing. When I talk to these people, I say something entirely differently, okay? So duplicitous means dishonest, lying. And if a duplicitous person fools me, I become his 
dupe. So that's what we're being told there. It says the human family would be the dupes of satanic lies. We'd, we'd be taken in without the correct knowledge of God. Yeah, let's go on. Jesus came to earth to teach men how to live a life of self-denial and self-sacrifice and how to carry out practical religion in their daily lives. He labored constantly for one object. All his powers were employed for the salvation of men, and every act of his life tended to that end. Okay, so that's, that's, that's an interesting thought here. <clears throat> he came to teach us how to live self-denial and self-sacrifice. But everything he did was for the salvation of men. So what does that mean about salvation, uh, about self-denial and self-sacrifice? He taught us to live lives of self-denial and self-sacrifice. And everything he did was, for the, was employed for the salvation of men. All his powers, every act tended to that end. What it tells me is that self-denial and self-sacrifice are essential for salvation. We're going to come back to that thought a little later on. But just keep this idea now. He, he labored constantly to that end. It was the salvation of, of human beings here, okay? I'm not being gender biased here. You know, it says men, but it means people, right? Okay. Let's go on. The great object that brought Christ to the earth was to reveal the Father. Well, I thought he was here to save men. Yeah, he is. The great object was to reveal the Father. Because that revelation perception thing, it's necessary for salvation. God is love. This was the great truth that Christ came to the world to reveal. The object of Christ's mission to the world was to reveal the Father. In all his ministry, all his, oh look, self-denial and self-sacrifice crop up again. Funny how that keeps showing up. All his self-denial and self-sacrifice, Christ's object was to reveal God to the world. Why? Because love is self-denying and self-sacrificing. And God is love, and God must be revealed, and Jesus was here to do it. Okay? It's a big thing. Christ exalted the character of God, attributing to him the praise and giving to him the credit of the whole purpose. How much? The whole purpose of his own mission on earth. Now, <clears throat> got to kick into English teacher mode here. Hope everybody's seeing the screen. What is this thing right here? Anybody know what that's called? Yeah, what a great answer. Did he say? Mm, that's close. You're in the right family, but the wrong child. Okay, so in English, we have three kinds of dashes. This is fun to know. So a little something extra here, just, okay. So the first one is the hyphen. It's a short one. What do we use hyphens for? Hyphenating words. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. Okay, I, I like it when things make sense, okay. So we use hyphens to hyphenate words, okay. Like you got to split the word at the end of the sentence or you're kind of jamming two words together somehow or other to make a compound adjective or something like that. Okay, so we use hyphens for that. There's another dash in the middle, I'll mention that in a little bit. And then there's a longer dash, and that's this one. And this one is called an M dash. Why is it called an M dash? What's that? Mm, what a great guess. <laughs> the thought was it was short for emphasis, and no, that's a, a great guess, but entirely wrong, unfortunately. It's because in the typesetting world, an M dash is the same width as a capital M. I should almost put one on the screen just so I can show you, show that. But yeah. An M dash is the same width as a capital M, and it is used as an interrupter. Okay, so now we'll, we'll finish the dash thought in a moment, but let's just deal with interrupters, okay? So in, in, when you've you got a sentence going on, you want to kind of throw something into the middle of it, we've got three levels of interrupters. You can just put in a comma. So you could say, Tom's brother, comma, Fred, 
comma, went to town. Okay? Well, that word Fred in there is kind of interrupting the flow. Tom's brother went to town. Okay. But it tells us something about Tom's brother, tells us his name was Fred, but we want to set that off, so we set that off with commas, right? So the commas are the, the light scale interrupters, okay? The M dash is the move it up a notch interrupter, so it's just, it just kind of stops the, the reader's train of thought a little bit more and injects a, a larger body than maybe just that one word Fred or something like that, okay? And then if you really want to stop them, you use parentheses. Okay, and so you can just think of that, just you know, a little free English tutorial going on here. You know, if you just, uh, the, they all do the same thing at relative strengths. It's kind of like, you know, baby bear, mama bear, and papa bear or something, you know, whatever, okay. So this is an M dash. It's the middle strength interrupter, but I told you there was another dash, and just to finish that off, it's a little bit shorter than the M dash, and it's called an N dash. Why do you suppose it's called an N dash? That's a good guess. It's the width of a capital N. Okay, and you only use that as a replacement for the word two. So if you see A dash Z, that should be, it's often a hyphen, which is just wrong, I'm sorry, but you know, it should be an N dash. That's really what it's supposed to be. Or uh, January dash April or something, whatever, a time frame, or from year this year to that year. That's where you use an N dash. And, and it's fun, and most people don't really care, so you can probably get away without that knowledge. But now that you know it, you might as well use it. Okay, so let's go back to our, our statement here. <clears throat> Christ exalted the character of God, attributing to him the praise and giving him the credit of the whole purpose of his own mission on earth. Dash, M dash, to set men right through the revelation of God. Okay, just like... Tom's brother dash Fred. Fred is Tom's brother. In English, we would say Fred is in apostrophe to Tom's brother. Okay, it means the same thing. Two ways of saying the same thing. That's what she's doing here. The whole purpose of his own mission on earth dash to set men right through the revelation of God. That was the whole purpose of his mission to earth, was to set men right, yes, he's working to save men, through the revelation of God. Huge issue going on here. Okay, statement continues. When the object of his mission was obtained, another M dash, the revelation of God to the world, again, in apostrophe, this was the object of his mission, the Son of God announced that his work was accomplished and the character of the Father was made manifest to men. When was that announcement? Oh, yeah, that's true. He, I would say he was announcing the, the truth and the theory of it, but I think this is a, a different announcement. I think this is, it is finished. When, what did it say here? When the object was attained, the revelation of God to the world, the Son of God announced and his work was accomplished. The character of the Father was made manifest to men. This is why Jesus came in the, the form of a servant and, and lived and died, even the death of the cross, because it required that to reveal the character of the Father. And only then could he say, it's done. God sent his Son into the world to reveal, so far as could be endured by human sight, the nature and the attributes of the invisible God. You know, in, in Desire of Ages and other places, Ellen White has this phrase that she uses, uh, in, always intrigued me. I don't understand it, but, you know, it's still intriguing. She speaks of how Jesus' div um, divinity flashed through humanity. Like when he went in to, to cleanse the temple, you know, he picked up the little scourge, which he didn't hit anybody with, but he picked it up, and he stands at the top of a, of a, a flight of stairs, and, and it's like, I don't remember any of the words she uses, but she, she paints this picture of how he's just standing there and his, his face is just like, and everybody out there, and they all turn and they look at him and it's just like, divinity flashed through humanity, she says, and they all, it's time to go. You know, <laughs> it's time to go. This is not a comfortable situation. Right at that point, it was a little bit more than could be endured by human sight. You know, 
Jesus came to reveal the Father. But he was trying to keep us alive at the same time. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like when you get in the car, it's great to know where the gas pedal is. Find the brake too, please. <laughs> you know, find the brake too. Okay, next statement here. Christ revealed all of God that sinful human beings could bear without being destroyed. I am really glad that God has a remarkable sense of precision. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like so many, when you get into recognizing this, this revelation perception function in the, in the aspect of salvation, you will see time after time where she'll say something like, you know, that the, the sacrifice of Christ, the, the, the ministry of Christ, the, the revelation of God, all, all those different things, she says about all of them, I think, um, was, uh, well, let's, let's use one from the sacrifice. It's an easy one to, to use. It, it was, the sacrifice was so great that no one could, in, in all the universe, could ever say that, that he could have given more. And then, like, almost in the next breath, she'll say, that and, and anything less would have been insufficient. <laughs> you know? And, and I think that's categorical because anything less would have left a doubt. Anything less than this revelation of absolute, complete self-denial and self-sacrifice for the good of others would have, have left a doubt. It's like, I worked for you for 10 years. Don't you believe that I'm, you know, well, yeah, probably you are, but, you know, you know, <laughs> there could be an ulterior motive. And Jesus ruled that out. Christ is the perfect representation of the Father. His life of sinlessness, lived in this earth and human nature, is a complete refutation of Satan's charge against the character of God. We're back to those accusations, Okay. Uh, Jesus was here on a mission, and his mission was to respond to Lucifer's accusations. I think it's important to recognize that this, this is not just something that's playing out willy-nilly. This is, this is a very definite uh, purpose going on here. Had God the Father come to our world and dwelt among us, veiling his glory and humbling himself that humanity might look upon him, the history that we have of the life of Christ would not have been changed in unfolding its record of his own condescending grace. In every act of Jesus, in every lesson of his instruction, we are to see and hear and recognize God. In sight, in hearing, in effect, it is the voice and movements of the Father. And that's what Jesus told Philip. You know, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You know, it's, it's like, if two weeks before, what, the... Um, Annunciation of the Virgin Mary, I suppose, you know, God and Jesus are sitting around talking, and one of them said, hey, let's mix it up. You go, I'll stay. You know, we, we would never know. <laughs> That's how, how perfect the representation was. He was seeing me and seeing the Father, so how can you say, show us the Father? <clears throat> I thought we had once before now, and there's a different statement, same idea though. Jesus could not express in words to the understanding of man, the love of the Father. He could only say, and she quotes John 3.16, <laughs> the, the, the most beloved, well-known verse in the whole Bible. That's the, that's, the only, that's the most that Jesus could say. But he could not, in words, express to the understanding of man the love of the Father. Fortunately, the paragraph continues. But he did express the love of God in his actions. So, I submit just as at this point, a partial concept I'd like you to get out of this. I submit that the, the, the idea of preaching our way to the second coming is fatally, fundamentally, and categorically flawed. It will never happen. Yes, there are the three angels flying in the midst of heaven presenting the everlasting gospel. But if there's anything we've learned in the military conflicts of recent years, you can't win a war with the Air Force alone. 
you need boots on the ground, and that's our job. There's got to be somebody down there in the mud and the blood slogging out the battle. And that's, that's, where, that's where Jesus was. And it was the actions. I don't have it on the screen here in a different sermon I have, but, you know, proclamation is the explanation of the demonstration. And demonstration, no, excuse me, and proclamation without demonstration is imagination. And, and I think that will tie in, you'll see how that ties in later on with the statement you've already no doubt heard about the worst evil when you split aspects of the, the work that God would have us to do. Jesus couldn't do it by words alone. What makes me think I can? <laughs> now, there's nothing wrong with preaching. I, I do it on occasion, okay? There's nothing wrong with preaching. But preaching alone is simply insufficient. Okay, there we go. The Savior of the world devoted more time and labor to healing the afflicted of their maladies than to preaching. Well, why not? <laughs> Do a cost, time, you know, benefit analysis type of thing. You get more bang for your buck from the actions. Spend more time on the actions. You still got to explain them, so throw in some sermons. It's good, okay? A blended ministry. Teaching, preaching, helping, healing. Teaching, preaching, helping, healing. That's what Jesus did. Christ came to this world for no other purpose than to display the glory of God that man might be uplifted by its restoring power. So yes, he had one act or one, one goal to save men. <clears throat> but he had no other purpose than to do that through the revelation of the Father, right? The display of the glory of God, the character of God, right? Christ revealed God to his disciples in a way that performed in their hearts a special work, such as he has long been urging us to allow him to do in our hearts. It seems like the disciples had an advantage. They were there. They could see and hear and touch. And we don't have that, but the work is the same. How did Jesus do it? We see, we've, we've seen what Jesus wanted to do, but how did he do it? Let's go to that. Okay, where am I? Something, uh, something jumped ahead on me here. Okay. Let me make sure I'm in the right spot. Yeah, okay. That's where I want to be, right there. Had Christ unmasked Judas, this would have been urged as a reason for the betrayal. And though charged with being a thief, Judas would have gained sympathy even among the disciples. The Savior reproached him not, reproached Judas not, and thus avoided giving him an excuse for his treachery. Okay, so there's a little ad-libbing introduction in here I should have probably done before this to, to explain how this fits in. But Christ was revealing the Father and in the process unmasking Lucifer. Judas was a microcosm second generation demonstration of Lucifer's principles. <clears throat> I think it's important here. There was a, a, a statement that I mentioned in the sermon this morning of how the Lord allowed Lucifer's rebellion to proceed a long while in heaven and nothing was done to, is it assist? Do you remember how the wording goes there? Um, nothing was done to assist the other angels. I think that's how it was. I think, I think my wording's off just slightly, but it's, you hopefully remember the idea. It's the one I said that I was, I was offended by. It just seems so wrong. Nothing was done to help them. How can, how can you do that? God, that just seems so wrong. And it was only when I saw how Jesus dealt with Judas that I saw that, no, that wasn't just some stupid thing that was done in heaven. That's the divine plan. Jesus warned the disciples about the leaven of the scribes and Pharisees. He didn't say a single thing about Judas. Notice what it says. If he had been unmasked, charged with being a thief, he would have gained sympathy even among the disciples. So here I am, I'm thinking, come on, Jesus, tell the guys that Judas is a rat. And Jesus is saying, 
Yeah, I know he's a rat. But it's just going to make it worse if I try to tell him. So was nothing done? I mean, bear in mind, at the Last Supper, Judas gets up and goes out to betray Christ. And the other disciples are like, I guess he's going to go buy some crackers. I mean, that's... <laughs> That's kind of spectacularly miss, missing the, the reality of the case, right? That's the level to which Jesus had warned them about Judas, as in nothing. Similarly, Lucifer, nothing. No warning, no, no accusations, no charges pressed against Lucifer. Did God truly do nothing to help the other angels? Well, he did, just exactly the same way that Jesus did nothing to help the other disciples. Except I would flip that around and say that everything possible had already been done because knowledge was never going to save them. The only thing that was going to save them was faith, and Jesus and God in heaven had done everything possible to lay a basis for faith. And those angels that chose to say, you know, Lucifer, you got some points. I don't understand it, but I, I trust God. They were safe. The 11 disciples, they trusted Jesus. They were safe. To try and accomplish that through intelligence and accusation would have put them at greater risk. doesn't say that they would have been lost, but they would have gained, strengthened their sympathy for, for, for uh, Judas. Okay, let's go on. Okay, take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Yeah, let's go on. Christ's life of sinlessness lived on this earth in human nature. It's a complete refutation of Satan's charge against the character of God. We saw that already. Let's go on. Oh, my clickers. Uh... Okay, make sure I'm more. Yeah, okay. Okay, so we're back at the accusations. And, and what I want to look at now is, is after the mission of Christ to earth, to reveal the Father, so after the crucifixion, resurrection, let's look at these accusations. How are they holding up? So number one, angels, and we're looking at this from the perspective of the universe who's been able to see the whole play out. Uh, human beings were still vastly confused, okay, of course, and some of them were totally uninformed, so that's a different category, but from... from Gabriel's position or, you know, the angels or unfallen worlds, how did this look? So, number one, angels are holy by nature and wise enough to govern themselves. They don't need God's law. Lucifer, you just killed the innocent son of God. That's not a recommendation of your holiness. That one's gone. I'm sorry, that's just gone. God was unfair when he exalted Jesus above Lucifer. Really? I mean, what, what Lucifer was saying there basically is, hold it, somebody's going to get a raise here. Somebody's going to get a promotion. And Jesus and I, we're, we're you know, it's kind of six of one, half dozen the other. I, I, I think I deserve it. And the rest of the universe now, after the crucifixion, they're like, no, we're actually really extremely happy that Jesus got the position and not you. Because we see where we would have ended up under your government, thank you. Anyhow, so one and two are, are just gone, right? Number three, God is selfish. Lucifer, come on, we just saw the crucifixion. God is selfish? You're going to try and sell us that one now? God is unforgiving and revengeful. Really, Lucifer, I'm sorry, these things are just, they're dying like flies here, okay? God's law is defective and needs to be changed. Really? Why? Neither hum angels nor human beings can obey God's law. He just did it, okay? So I like to illustrate this one. So, <clears throat> I tell the audience that, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm probably a stranger to most people in the audience here, and they may not realize that I like to do a little weightlifting. And in fact, I can bench press 400 pounds. Now, for those of you who are not present here, there was a little bit of a snicker in the audience. And that may be, I've, a snicker is actually kind of generous. Uh, I've had outright bursts of hysterical laughter uh, on previous occasions. 
because it's, it's fairly reasonable for someone to take a look at my somewhat scrawny physique and question the veracity of my claim that I can bench press 400 pounds. I don't know. I don't, I'm, I'm sorry. I know nothing about weightlifting. I have no idea what it takes to bench press 400 pounds. I don't know if anybody can bench press. Maybe that's, maybe that's a ridiculous thing. I think, I don't know. I'm pretty sure I couldn't. I've never really tried. It'd be fun, but I'm sure, you know, whatever. But, but, suppose I made my claim and you laughed at me. And suppose I had a bench and a little stand and the bar and 400 pounds on it. And I did it. I like to say there's a, a technical term for that moment. It's known as na, 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 na. <laughs> okay? There is nothing so sweet as doing what you were told you could not do. <laughs> Nobody can keep God's law. He just did it, Lucifer. <laughs> Five and six are, are, are gone. Okay. That's two-thirds of them completely wiped out by Christ's life, ministry, death, resurrection. Now, you may be surprised to find that there are still three on the list. Jesus did not eliminate seven, eight, and nine. Now, it's interesting. Notice number nine says that God is lying about the first eight. Well, God's been proven right on one through six. So if he's proven right on seven and eight, number nine just evaporates. Poof, gone. So why didn't he finish the job? I mean, you know, he was here, right? You know, I mean, <laughs> come on. You went to a lot of trouble to come down here to, to deal with this. Why didn't you finish the job? Well, it's an interesting thing. Seven and eight are not accusations that make any difference or have any bearing whatsoever on the normal operation of God's government. Seven and eight only become significant in case God wants to save people like you and me. They have to do with the declared intention of God to forgive sinners. We'll see that more clearly later on in the, in the week as we go ahead. There are statements. I don't have them here. I, I could get them. If anybody has my book, this Sozo, there are statements in there. After, after Christ did what he did, the unfallen world was completely, un, unfallen worlds, were completely satisfied that the government of heaven was the only one they wanted. And they were expecting at that point for all sin and sinners to be destroyed. And they would be perfectly satisfied. Justice is served, love has been shown, everything's, you know, it's all good. And, and Jesus says, no, I'm not going to destroy them all. I can save some. I can save some. I won't get them all, sadly, but I can save some. And so we have now a controversy that has moved through six accusations down to seven and eight. I, I really like the idea of, of fighting where the battle is, <laughs> if that makes sense, you know? Um, I would like to see God's people focus their attention on, on seven and eight. Nine will take care of itself if we get seven and eight resolved. We'll talk about that more later on. But that, I believe, oh, yes, okay. One last item. I, I, I'll, we can get this in. It's not, not bad. Um, <clears throat> Ellen White made up some really classic signature phrases of her own. It's just kind of worth noting. Some, some of the things that she commonly says, you, you would say, wow, she says that so much, she must be quoting scripture. And often when she says something over and over, it is scripture. But there are a number of 
classic expressions that she uses that are her own formulation. That they, it's not a scripture, not a direct, it's built on scripture, but it's not from a single scripture. And one of those is she speaks of Christ as our substitute and surety. What does she mean, Christ, our substitute and surety? Well, substitute is a pretty easy concept. It's someone who takes the place of, or something that takes the place of something else, okay? But surety is the part that's a, a little more questionable. What, what is this surety thing, okay? Well, surety is a typically complex English word, and it has a whole kind of range of meanings. But if you look at them, you'll see that there are several, let's see, the uh, one, two, three, four. The first four, particularly, are, are easy to see as guaranteeing something in advance, so to speak, okay? This is what it is, or this is going to happen, or this is, there's a certainty, it's, it's, there's no question, it's, it's secure, it's safe, it's, you know, okay, that kind of a thing. Down on number five, you can kind of see, this is like insurance, you know? Well, we hope your house doesn't burn down, but if it burns down, we'll cover it, okay? So there's, the first four are kind of before the fact. Five is like, we'll, 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 we'll take care of the problem if it arises, okay? Um, six is a little specialized, seven is a little specialized. So it's really the first five I'm, I'm primarily focusing on here. When Ellen White's using the word surety, is she meaning a guarantee before or a remedy after? Let's see how she uses it. God with us is the surety of our deliverance from sin, the assurance of our power to obey the law of heaven. The Redeemer of the world in the wilderness of temptation fought the battle upon the point of appetite in our behalf. As our surety, he overcame, thus making it possible for man to overcome in his name, Christ came to our world as man's surety, preparing the way for him to gain the victory by giving him moral power. Christ came to our world to be man's surety, to overcome in his behalf, to live for him a sinless life. See, that's, that's the substitute aspect. The, the two concepts go so close hand in hand that in his power they might obtain the victory over sin. That's the surety. Every eye in the unfallen universe is bent upon those who profess to be Christ's followers. Just think about that. The whole unfallen universe is watching Christians, and I would say probably some of the Adventists in particular. What share of the inhabitants of the unfallen universe do you think you get, right? You know? I did a calculation that one time. I don't remember what it was. It's something like, was it, 2.5 billion Christians on Earth and... I don't remember, 600 billion uh, s galaxies out there with, you know, 600 million uh, planets per galaxy or something, some crazy thing. You get, you know, you, you run the math on it. You figure out, you have a lot of people watching you, is, is what I'm saying, okay? So every eye in the unfallen universe is bent upon those who profess to be Christ's followers. Here, in this atom of world, and earnest warfare is going on, a battle in which Christ, our substitute and surety, has engaged in our behalf and conquered. Now, this is a fascinating thing, and, and, it's, and yet there's a little oddity to it. Jesus did the cool stuff. <laughs> He's the one who engaged in the battle and conquered. But they're watching us. Why would anyone out there watch us? Because the paragraph goes on. Now we, Christ's precious possession, must become soldiers of his cross and conquer in our own behalf on our own account through the power and wisdom given us from above. The influence of the cross of Calvary, the revelation of the Father, is to vanquish every earthly and spiritual evil power. And we need to know the plan of the battle, that we may work in harmony with Christ. We need to know the plan of the battle. The battle, the plan, is for us to benefit from the 
substitutionary work of Christ taking our place, that he can be our surety, that we can conquer, what does it say? On, in our own behalf, on our own account. There is something yet to be demonstrated by the church to the unfallen worlds. The manifold wisdom of God. Ephesians 5.10, I think it is. Okay, closing up. Pray as did Moses. Lord, reveal to me thy glory. That was the mission of Christ. A revelation of the goodness, the tenderness, and love of Jesus toward fallen man will cause self to sink into nothingness and will exalt Jesus. Lift him up, the man of Calvary. Talk of Jesus and his matchless love. This is where many who present the truth fail. They talk doctrines, but do not dwell upon the matchless, forbearing love of Jesus. We need to have Jesus lifted up, not solely as a substitute, but as our substitute and our surety. And that's where we'll end. But the story doesn't end. We've seen Lucifer make his case. We've seen Jesus make his case. But the story continues. Pastor Phil, well, you take over now. But don't go anywhere, actually. So uh, tomorrow night, why... And we're just getting started. Just getting started. We're having fun. Are we, are we going to hit the last two, three tomorrow night? Is that when we get into that? Partly. What? You're talking about the accusation. Yes, yes. Yeah. What's tomorrow night? Tomorrow night is the good Kellogg. So we're bringing what's been happening in heaven down to our day. Down and to how a, it's coming a much to more contemporary here. example of the exact same principles and exact same tactics. So what, what happened there, now we're bringing it down to today. Yeah. That's now, we, now we get to see, and we, we, we've seen Lucifer, we've seen Jesus, now we get to see how this plays out actually t tomorrow night and Monday, Monday night. night. Yeah. We're going to be looking at both of those scenarios of Lucifer and Christ but this time they'll come in the other order, Christ and then Lucifer, mm -hmm. in the career of Dr. John Harvey Kellogg, wow. who played a, an amazing role in God's work on the right side and then flipped the traces and played an amazing role in Lucifer's work on the, on the wrong side of things, all in a single individual. And, and, and the lessons and the tactics are just stunningly similar and interesting and compelling. Well, and then as we end out the week, we're going to be coming down to today, how yeah. what happened there, this word, the alpha of apostasy that some may have heard of, which is what, what we see in Kellogg's life, what we pull from that to understand the omega of apostasy is coming down to the end. Right. And also, in the good phase of Kellogg, he contributed to the beginning of the loud cry, which has yeah. obvious implications to the fulfillment of the loud cry at the that's end. Right. So we've kind of just blown the whole week here and, and, and uh, done a spoiler on the whole thing. But that's okay. No, but it, they need to know what's coming. I think it's <laughs> going to be powerful. Going, Absolutely. Yeah, that's, but that's, that's right. And, and Lindsay's got a book. Yes. We'll, we'll cover those. Some other time. Well, I'll, I'll just mention them briefly. Okay. Tomorrow night, we're going to have several of your books available in the back. Um, the cover that you'll see of the book there is the same cover we had for the uh, sure. Week of Prayer. Tactics is powerful. I've got my copy, and I'm starting to go through it. Okay. And that's, I'll just, just say, that's, that's basically where this material is drawn from. It's from that book. So, like, the, the morning session on Lucifer, that was the first 70 pages. That's right. So actually, we didn't cover everything in 70 pages. So you know, there's, there's a lot more there's, there. There's more details yeah. that, and, and it fills in some of the gaps. That's right. Well, Brother Fiedler, thank you. I want to thank you all for watching. I know we've had quite a few um, on YouTube, and I know that others will be watching it later and on Facebook. Uh, thank the team that's been here. I'm going to ask you where you are watching at home or wherever you are, that you will bow your heads with us as we pray. And thank the Lord for what he's taught us this evening and help us to be in the have the wisdom to know how to wrap our minds around these incredible concepts that we've been wrestling with from church today, this evening. We'll continue this next week. Bow your heads with me for prayer. Father in heaven, we have been plunging some of the depths of profound, far beyond us concepts and realities of what have led us to the mess that we're in now, but also what you have been doing to turn the tide of the battle and to win as many souls and save as many souls as possible. 
we want to be faithful soldiers for you. We want to faithfully move forward as a congregation, as a conference, as Christians. We want to be the light to this community that is so desperately needed. And so I ask that you will send your spirit and angels to rest upon us, to guide and direct us. And may we, through the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, have minds that you enlighten to better understand the tactics that are happening and how we can fit into this. We thank you now. Bless each one here and those that are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. Tomorrow night, 6.30, the weather looks good. I want to encourage you, if you are able, be here tomorrow night live. It is so much better it is. when we're live. We'll have the questions. If you've got the questions, send them in. I know people enjoy watching them. God bless you. Good night. We'll see you tomorrow evening.